All right, good afternoon, everybody. We're going to start. Um, in case you're wondering where you are, you are in Hey, I Know You, uh, where we're going to be talking about new frontiers in interactivity. So if this is not where you want to be, then now is the time to go. Um, a little housekeeping. So we have three speakers who are going to be giving some pretty interesting um, talks. What I'd like to do, if possible, is to hold as much of the questioning until the end so everybody has enough time to show you the stuff they want to show you because it's pretty cool. So if you have a desperate question that you really need to ask immediately after somebody's finished with their talk, then by all means, we'll take a couple of questions, but I'd like to save as much of the Q&A for the very end as possible, if that's okay with you guys. Okay, so um, uh, without further ado, we're gonna launch right into Ms. Kate Haley Goldman from Audience Viewpoints, who is gonna be, Kate is one of the people who has the evidence when you're looking for, like, does this work or does this not work? We all have our opinions. Kate brings evidence to it. switch back and forth because of the, excuse me, technical difficulties. Um, so as Ed said, I'm going to try and both control my touch screen and hit play at the same time. I can try if you want to hit play. Yeah, that's good. All right. So um, I'm Kate Haley-Goldman. I run an audience research and evaluation group called Audience Viewpoints. One of the things that I specialize in is the evaluation of technology, and I've been doing mobile evaluation on mobile guides now for over 10 years. Um, done some augmented reality exhibits, a whole bunch of websites, some mixed reality pieces. But what I'm gonna talk to you today right now mostly about is multi-touch tables. Um, I am the co-PI of a major NSF project called Open Exhibits. So open, I'm gonna draw most of my data from Open Exhibits, but I'm gonna have a few other projects that I have data from um, to look at as well. Um, so Open Exhibits is designed to create modules for multi-touch tables for small institutions in particular. So to create timelines, to create map-based modules, to create collections viewers that institutions that don't have those development resources can put on their, um, on their tables and show their content in their institution without developing software whole cloth. Um, IDEM is the principal investigator for that to create the multi-touch tables in the software. My role really is to look at how users use these tables in a exhibit-based experience, right? Is it a novelty that detracts? What kind of staying time can we hope from this? Are we gonna get the type of social interaction that we're looking for in terms of these tables? I've done a couple of other different types of studies on tables and we're gonna talk between the two or three of us um, about one creating multi, um, called Creating Museum Multimedia for Everyone about accessibility issues in using multi-touch tables but also other technologies as well. Um, so to echo Ed before I go too much further in, in this, um, one of the outgrowths of the Open Exhibits project, it was a conference called Human-Computer Interaction in Informal Science Environments. And we have, at the end of the session, giveaways of the proceedings from the HCI plus Informal Science Education Workshop. So there was a wide variety of speakers brought together in um, Albuquerque this past June. Um, to talk about the impact of technology in their environments. And I have free proceedings for anyone who is interested. I have to say, my colleagues wrote some fantastic papers for this, and, and we'd love to be able to get them out to the rest of the greater community. There's a whole box, but we're not going to give them out till the end. You get the <laughs> first <laughs> distribution <laughs> in, you have to stick it through. Um, in terms of these sorts of things. So um, let's see. So in looking at multi-touch tables, um, what we want to do is, ah, I just slipped out of it, I'm sorry. Can I swear in the editing and in the speech? It's being captured forever on audio and video. <laughs> okay, I just switched these out, sorry. After all that time. Uh, my apologies, back mode. Mm -hmm. I have to go back into, I'm, I've switched to Utopia. I'm going to take do you want me to try? Yeah. And you keep talking? Yeah, I'm going to keep talking. Um, so one of the reasons that why 
how are we looking at tables in terms of this? Is that there's been some research in terms of interactivity, mainly by Dirk von Loam and Christian Heath was one of the, in, in the UK, was one of the impetuses for the Open Exhibits project. We wanted to look at the social interaction that occurs around a table that does not occur around a wall-based environment, right? So when we have this board game type environment, there's a thought that we, was, we could get deeper interactivity than what we have, which is in most institutions, which is there's one driver and then there's an audience saying, no, you should hit this button. No, you should back up a little, try this option. Um, and really engage in, in some more meaningful conversation around interactives. Um, and so looking at form features of physical interactives within science museums, we, we landed that the table environment might promote this type of interactivity. And the developers of multi-touch technology felt that this might be a more social environment. So the research that I was conducting was to compare these two environments um, and, and to see where that would lead. Um, there are a lot of different types of settings that you can use um, in terms of these environments. Um, yeah, I was trying to switch it so I could actually see my notes because I have numbers <laughs> to quote. And when we switched it back out, I have numbers to quote about stay time. So I know I knew what we were doing. I was trying to be more subtle than that. <laughs> uh, um, uh, the, there we go. So I can actually show them what there is. So. Um, Part of the thing that we noticed in the different tables that we're working with is that the scale and the size of these would, uh, would influence the amount of social interaction that we would have. Um, so we conducted um, studies at the New Mexico Museum of Natural History, at the Maxwell Museum of Anthropology, um, and at the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center, all headquartered in Albuquerque, New Mexico. These studies were designed to be pure research in terms of the interaction of the individuals in each of these three study sites. Um, one of the first things that we noticed is that we had a relatively short stay time at each of the tables. These tables were placed within the, within, with appropriate content within each of the exhibits. The stay time was around two minutes for, for each table, and then people would move on. Um, this surprised me because I've done research in other settings where the stay time was much higher. Now, as we all know, two minutes is really long, right, in an exhibition time. I don't want to remember what the, what the median time is for art museums, but in science and in museums, it's something like 17 seconds at a particular interactive. So two minutes is a huge amount of time. And yet, in my previous trials with multi-touch tables, the average time that I had was nine minutes and 17 seconds at the multi-touch table, right? And so that's yeah. a average time, right? So the, the, the longest group in that particular study stayed 25 minutes, and that's after they had waited 25 minutes just to get to near the table to touch it, right? And so there's a huge draw in having that kind of, of base of time. This, um, this type of interaction was often the longest stay within any particular exhibition, right? And so that was one of the points that we wanted to look at. And of all of the different exhibits I looked at, the multi-touch table got the longest stay of any particular component within it. However, it was not the most visited. So in any particular room, the collection's artifacts within it or the other interactives would often be more visited by the visitors than the multi-touch table. So it was this interesting um, twist back and forth with the critics of introducing this kind of technology as visitors are going to spend all their time on the table. Well, they don't spend all their time on the table. Um, they spend a significant chunk of time on the table, um, but it's actually not the most attended to item, that the collections tended to be far more attended to with any particular exhibition than, than the table itself. Um, the other piece is whether or not it detracted from these, those collections objects, right? So am I spending less time at the objects because I've spent all this time at the table? Um, and what we learned in particularly in the Hatfield Science Center testing is that that tended not to be true. Visitors would go all the way through the exhibit and that what the table tended to do was add time rather than detract time from the other exhibit elements, which was not something that we were sure was going to happen at that point. Um, the table did serve as, as this honeypot effect, right? It was highly sticky. 
Not only did people spend those nine minutes on average at the table um, in, the, in this one particular study, um, but they tended to draw other visitors there, right? So if, I don't know if any of you saw the little clips of opening videos from that same place. And you'd see visitors holding back and waiting and watching someone else move it. And, and, and this is what we call the honeypot effect, when you see some other visitor at an interactive and you're waiting to move in because it looks more entrancing because someone else is using it. And the tables in particular, if no one else was using them, people would tend to walk by. It's only when they saw other visitors engaging that they would want to actually take that kind of step. Germain. This is a, a um, tabletop exhibition at the Franklin Institute um, called, uh, um, called Power Hungry, and it's in a typical institution in um, typical format in a placemat format. So you can see that there are four different players within this table space setting, and they're moving things to the center. They each have their own field of play, um, and the, they're interacting with their own items. And then they're moving things to the center to change, in this case, the city around them and the energy consumption around that city. Um, this is an interesting impact in terms of social interaction in that people are very individual, right? So if the table is designed to have that collaborative environment, then primarily I'm playing within my own space. Uh, and that was something that we, we noticed again and again is that the format of the table tended to then, what we put the content on, tended to have some sort of barrier um, in, in creating the collaborative space that we we're hoping for. Um, the placement settings were the most effective way in some ways to use with these simulations, um, and yet we, we didn't always get the type of interaction that we were hoping for, and it, it, it varied highly depending on the game. Um, I think the other thing influencing stay time with this is quite obvious. This simulation can only be played for so long, right? You can go back and play it again. But like what we saw in the New Mexico studies, we had a two minute stay time because essentially after two minutes there wasn't much more to do. You can play it again and get a four minute stay time out of that. But there's a limit to your content. This is a, is, is a limited experience within that. The much longer stay times we got were out of free form experiences where that were much more experiential, right? So visitors can come in and create a collaborative environment and then back up and watch other individuals play with it. Um, that we've seen are also content rich. I just mentioned the ones that are more experiential can have more, a longer stay time. The critique that I received about this when we were writing the grant uh, was that it was entirely novelty based, right? So they see this shiny object and they come up to it and they flick photos around and then the children run away. So and you might see this in the video that I was showing at the beginning was, are they really getting any content um, or are they simply moving those pieces around the table and then rushing away again. Um, and what you can't hear in this is, is the audio-based pieces, right? So the setup that we have from the screens that you show, uh, I showed coming in is an area like this room, but it is entirely mic'd and has video cameras everywhere. So we're recording all of the visitor interaction through that. And this next phase of the research project will, um, will involve counting the different types of interactions that we're seeing. So we're in the middle of transcribing those videos now and looking at the different behavioral markers. 
But what we've already noticed in just going through the first dozen videos is this extremely rapid transition from this sort of novelty, shiny new state to content-based states, no matter what we're talking about. So there's an initial, let's play through and see how this moves. And, and generally, within under a minute, people have moved to this, well, why do you think it does that? What are they talking about here? Do you know what this represents in this screen? Let's talk about the history, the art, the science that is occurring behind that time, time and time again. What we also see, and perhaps that this is the novelty, is people returning to the table over and over again. So when you're watching videos, as I have been, of these visitors coming through, um, you can, you'll see often a child leaving, uh, leading the, the chart, coming up to the table messing around with it, the adults coming slowly in and starting to pay attention, and then this move towards content, and then the, the um, often they'll take a picture um, of the table itself. In the, in the videos we've done so far, about half of them will take a picture of the content on the table, um, and then take pictures of people using the table. They move away again, and you continue watching. And then 20 minutes later, sometimes it's an hour later, sometimes it's two hours later, you think, hey, there's that girl in the red sweater again. Let me scroll back. And they, especially the children, but we have also had the adults do this pattern where they go out, see more exhibits, come back to the table, go out, see more exhibits, come back to the table, uh, see more exhibits. And this pattern was picked up first in the Vancouver Aquarium, where they documented almost all of their, um, their visitors reacting with the table that way. And the setting for that particular study is the table is in the middle, um, and the fish are around you, and you're going as a labeling exercise to come back and get more and more content about the fish, right? So you're interacting with the primary material, the animals, as you see that, and then you come back to get content from the table and go back out again, and come back out from, uh, um, to the table to get more content and go back out again. Um, and so even though it wasn't the item most attended to within the exhibit, it was one of their primary interpretive objects. They spent more time with the collections, but the table hauled them over and over again back to this place. Um, that study was completed quite some time ago in Vancouver, ooh, quite some time ago being like 2009 now, um, 2010. And um, since that time we've noticed the rates dropping for how many people are familiar with tables, right? So the, the first studies that I conducted, 93% of people had never worked on a multi-touch table before. Um, and now when I talk to professionals in the field, they say, well, most people have seen them in museums before, or at least half the people have seen them in museums before. But, but the truth is, the studies we conducted this summer, 80% of them had never worked on a table before, never seen it in person. And they would say, I've seen this on CNN, I've seen it elsewhere, but it is still very much a new technology for the visitors that we've been working with. And there's been some rural urban dis difference in that, but only by a percentage point or two. Um, and yet, despite the fact that they're novel, they are very comfortable with the gestures, right? This is not necessarily something that's intuitive, but something that they felt very comfortable with. So social interaction, in my last couple of minutes, well, we'll look at the, while I talk about social interaction. Um, so the, me the central metaphor for the table for most groups that I've worked with have, has been that this is the kitchen table, right? And people will sit down, seating certainly affects daytime, people will sit down and have a discussion about this. But what we've learned in, in the research is that this actually acts more like a buffet. Um, people come in, they take some pieces, they go back out again to the content, and then and they come back and take pieces again. It has social interaction within it, um, but in the, in the most recent study we completed, it, there was no more social interaction than the, than the touch walls that we were working with. There was no more evidence of learning than the touch walls that we interacted with. Um, there, the only changes between a touch wall and a touch table were the group-to-group -group interaction, right? So this is one group, and what you would see later on if you were to run this video for, for hours is that you would see one of them comes back and is essentially mm -hmm. scaffolding another group's interaction, right? She comes back to play a little bit, and some other group asks her how she's done this, um, and she tells them a little bit about the table, and then she moves on. And so this, 
this group-to-group -group interaction was much stronger in the table than it was in, in the wall itself. Um, it was also, we're starting to see, haven't quite fully analyzed the data yet, so we may have more interaction about content on the table than we do on the wall, but that may be a factor in the seating encouraging the stay time, right? So if you're at the wall, an interactive wall, and you're messing with it, there's only so much stay time that you eventually have. Um, it tends to be a very individual experience. Um, and while there's discussion amount it, the, the playthrough time isn't quite as long as it might be at other places. So I was gonna talk a tiny bit about accessibility. Um, Multi-touch tables are horribly inaccessible to, uh, to blind and visually impaired individuals. Um, and the testing that we did with, with blind visitors in New Mexico taught me very many things. One is that, that blind visitors aren't all that fond of museums, typically speaking, and that we had to work very hard to get them in because there frankly was a lot that was very frustrating within the museum in setting. The table, despite the fact that there's no tactile interface and therefore very difficult to work with, provided a lot of potential benefit to our low, vis uh, low vision visitors, right? If they could move and open up these pieces, it allowed them a window into the collections, a screen into the collections that they did not have in the other place. So I know you're gonna talk a little bit about some of the testing and I am way out of time, no, having no, had you're only a little bit out of time. Uh, technical <laughs> difficulties. Um, so while this research is still emerging, I think the, in, in conclusion, the, the, the interaction between tables and walls is particularly interesting. I, as a researcher, would have expected to see much more significant differences between a wall-based experience and a table-based experience in terms of social interaction. We haven't yet experienced that. There's little glimmers of pieces, and if you're trying to get groups to talk to each other, then a table may be your better choice. Um, but at this point in time, it's gonna be the content that's gonna be the primary determinant of that interaction rather than the form feature that, that signals to the visitor when it's time to be social. Awesome. I have more research findings in here and um, would love to talk to you all about your, your table and wall-based experiences later. All right. Thank you very much, Kate. All right, does anybody have a burning question for Kate? We can take one or two. Or we can move right on to Keir Winesmith. Going once, going twice. One. How do you define accessibility for wheelchairs? Um, so technically the table is, is um, you mean in terms of getting up to the in, yeah, in field of range, range of motion? Not well, but frankly it wasn't well for the blind visitors using canes either. So you have to come up to the table, you're holding the table to get, to get oriented, you drop your cane on the floor typically over and over again and put your foot on it so that you know that you can find it again. Um, and then you have to keep one hand on the edge of the table to maneuver around in, in a in generally in a grid-like fashion. Um, range of motion for, for wheelchairs really depended. It was very hard it, on how well you could get oriented at first, right? So if you're approaching the table from the right direction, then your frame of reference goes well, but, but that approach doesn't necessarily always work. Um, I think for, for some visitors, the benefits in being able to see better out, uh, outweighed that in being able to scroll through. All right. One quick one. One quick one. Um, it's, so none of the projects that I have data for this, we are, I'm running, um, two multi-touch and wall-based projects for art museums right now um, that we don't have data from. The one piece that we had that was closer to that in terms of at least collection space was an anthropology museum where it was all essentially art slash artifacts. It was presented in an art-based format. And um, people didn't tend to touch the tables because they didn't realize that they were live. So, um, <laughs> because nothing else you can touch in the room. <laughs> Um, so we had put up signs that said, please touch that, and that raised the rate to about 50%. But, but yes, it was, a, it, was a, it was an issue with getting people to touch. All right, so without further ado, let me introduce Keir Winesmith, who is the head of digital at SF MoMA, and he's gonna be talking about how digital can amplify the audience's voice in official museum output. And 
and actually he's going to talk a lot about Anish Kapoor, so that's going to be kind of cool, right? Yeah. So, um, <coughs> so this is my name. Uh, that's my Twitter handle, and I blog about a lot of this stuff at that URL. Um, so I'm currently like have a big long title, but I pretty much just say get it digital because it's easier. But I used to be at the Museum of Contemporary Art Australia, and that's where a lot of this research comes from. But I only just recently moved to the United States a couple months ago. So I was going to call this uh, Hash MCA now, uh, the MCA is Digital Pulse, but I was also going to call it a living catalogue for Anish Kapoor, revealing untold stories in rich media museum publications, because that's like the motive. Um, and then I kind of came up with this title, because I'm going to talk about two things, and then I realised that I had actually put in the program something really dull and dry, so thank you for coming for something that sounds really <laughs> dull and dry. I'm going to do my best to make it not dull and dry. Um, so I work, I used to work there, and so we would need to compete with that, and at New Year's Eve, that, and so when we did work, it needed to have a, a kind of commitment to the audience, and a commitment to story, and a commitment to quality, that could compete with the things who are around in Circular Quay, probably the most good looking harbour in the world. Um, I'm now in a very ugly harbour <laughs> in San Francisco. So that's the background, and then we'll just pretend the, the, the talk is starting now. Um, so Anish Kapoor came to Australia um, right after the Museum of Contemporary Art reopened after a big refurb. Um, it was an enormous show, ridiculously large in scale, and this is actually one of the more compelling pieces in the show. However, represented in 2D, it doesn't actually come to life. It only makes sense when you're with the work. And a lot of Anish Kapoor's work is kind of like interactive work in that your presence is what makes the work come to life. Or it, in fact, exists. In many cases, he says, there's sort of language that says that my work doesn't exist when it's not being viewed. Um, there's also kind of really fascinating stories around how these works come to bear. So this is a work called Memory, which again, only exists in your mind. You can't see the whole work from any vantage within the museum. You can see inside it from one vantage, and you can see elements of it from another vantage, and you've got to put it back together in your mind, which is kind of beautiful and poetic, but it's also, like, the how do they do that becomes a fascinating question. And for us, what's really interesting in these sorts of works that he does, which are almost always documented in massive 600-page books like this, <laughs> is that in massive 600-page books like this, you don't get this experience. You don't get the, the surprised smiles. And she's smiling because she's just said something. And you expect this work to refract your, your, your image. It's perfect for a selfie. But what you don't expect is the sound, what it does to the sound, because it's a big refractive disc that's been broken up. What it does to your voice as you speak is really otherworldly. And so she's laughing because she just said something and it's made, her, it's made her surprised. And you can't put that in one of those. So when we were told Anish was coming, I thought it'd be much more interesting to do something like this, which I call a living catalog. Living in that it had a preview version before the show started. It had an installation version while the work, while the work was being installed and came out the day Oh no, it came out a couple of days after the, the show opened. And they had an experiential version, which we put out the day that the exhibition closed, looking back at what it was like to actually experience the exhibition. Hmm. So one of the key works was called Sky Mirror, and it was outside the museum. And you can only understand that in the context of it competing with some of the most iconic buildings in the world, including the St. John House. So we made a panorama. The, the cover is panoramic. Throughout the... We've been very fortunate to work on this video. exhibition with Anish and with the studio. And in order to reflect that process, we decided to make an e-publication rather than a conventional catalogue. So that is um, our director. And the reason this was possible was because I pitched to Anish that we should do this. And then he said, this sounds like a great idea. We've never done one of these before. Send me an iPad, tell, like, tell me what it is that you're going to be doing. He got into it, and they gave us two and a half gig worth of image content to use however we want. We also got behind the scenes installation shots. This is probably one of the most fun things that I've ever done. I, we were craning in a massive sculpture through the ceiling of our building because the, the sculpture was so heavy that the, wall, the, the walls couldn't take the weight. So we cut a hole in this new building that we've just built. And I went out with a GoPro, like the one that's over there, and I approached these burly builders and said, so we're doing this like, we're doing this, 
to show, and I don't want to document this moment because this is really important for us. I've got this little camera, and, and he looked at me immediately and said, oh, GoPro, I love GoPros. Let's stick one on the crane head. Bring the crane head down. Stuck the GoPro on, and we filmed the crane craning this massive sculpture inside the, this little gap in the, the gallery roof that was two inches wider than the sculpture. So that was kind of a cool little project, which we then obviously turned into a video, and we cut it that night and put it out the next morning, which was kind of cool. So we, wow. we surfaced the stories of the people who worked to bring the exhibition to life. So this is, the first person was an engineer, this is Nick Viking, he's an engineer who worked out how much weight our building could take. The person is Tony Mile, who's the exhibition services kind of champion, if you will, uh, who worked really closely with the engineer to make it possible to even put on this show in a museum that had literally only reopened six months before. We're cutting holes, knocking down walls in the museum we've only just finished, which is, it's actually kind of silly, really. We brought it in shipping containers by boat. Um, there were 22 containers. Um, we brought these in from various destinations around the world. The period of time it took for us to empty all those containers and get the works either onto the front lawn for the assembly of Sky Miller or upstairs into the gallery for the installation upstairs on level three or level one, we had 11 days. So it's very hard to imagine how even you can do 22 containers in 11 days, but somehow we did it. Um, what do you think was the most difficult thing that we had to deal with? So the thing that's kind of cool about this is we had a, we had a video of, of Anish talking to our director about the project. We had a video of Anish talking about his artistic process. We had videos of all sorts of elements within the, elements within the show that brought it to life. The thing that got the most views was two nerdy engineers nerding out on how nerdy it was to put the show on. Right's way over what the, the floor should be able to take. Once we started talking to the, um, the original engineers of memory, um, and we had started to understand how it all fits together and how it sits on the floor, then we could we started to see see the light, I suppose, see how we could actually support memory on, on our gallery floor. It's an extremely tight space and we had to get the sculpture to just kiss the walls. Yeah, no, it um, was like that, wasn't it? That, that was yeah, cool. and, um, and there's a reason for that as well. We, there are actually props hidden within the walls which stop the, yeah. the beautiful egg-shaped um, sculpture from rolling around. Um, and another... So you can probably guess why it's compelling viewing. So I'll, I'll let you follow up later on. But, so that's part of the installation story. We wanted to tell... We wanted to do the things you can't do in a pre-published, delivered on the day the exhibition opens publication. The other thing that we wanted to do, which for us was really important, um, is to celebrate the audience. And the, the place we started with that was to talk... Can you tell us a little bit about that history? Yeah, I was working on an exhibition of new British sculpture, uh, which actually opened here at the end of 84 and went into 85. show to life, which is people in the space telling stories either to each other, with each other, or through digital media. And so we wanted to highlight um, the audience experience of Anish Kapoor. And this is what makes it a living catalog, in that we bring those stories to life, and we release that version afterwards. It becomes the authority vision of what it was like to attend that exhibition is seen through the eyes of our audience, not through our curators, not through the artists themselves. So um, let's listen to Anna. My name is Anna McAboy. So let's take you back to the start of your experience. Mm -hmm. You first walked into the gallery. Can you tell me what things you first saw, what you first noticed? I guess the first thing that struck me was the scale of everything, that everything was, was really huge. Yeah. So the, the first thing that struck you was the scale. Mm. Can you tell me a bit more about that? Yeah, I guess uh, everything is just huge and also um, hard to get your head around, you can't really work out exactly how big anything is or, you know, depth-wise and, and that sort of thing. It kind of messes with your perceptions a lot, so. So Anna gets to tell the story of what it's like to be in the museum. We worked with a local researcher from the University of Technology Sydney who led the kind of guided discussions 
um, with a number of people and we kind of pick out the ones that could compellingly tell, like, who could articulate their experience. Because a lot of people just went, oh, it wasn't so big, or wow, did you see my kids? That was really fun. So we kind of, we had to cull that out and we, we ended up with people like uh, Clyde. Thank you for agreeing to be interviewed. Can you tell me your name? Uh, Clyde. Did you know very much about Anish Kapoor's artwork before you came here? I'd never heard of him until two weeks ago. I'd never heard of Anish Kapoor. And what's your impression of the show, having seen all of it now? I'm always saying to my daughter, there's some sort of point at which art is really just craft. I can see a lot of uh, technical stuff here. Whether it's art, I'm not sure, but it's interesting. So you're interested in the distinction or the similarity between art and craft? Well, I'm curious about it because it's quite clear to me that when I see some stuff that people call art, I'm actually looking at craft. What's the distinction? Maybe it's the fact that craft has got less imagination in it. So this is perhaps at the art end of the spectrum. And what else do you think distinguishes craft? What are its properties? The quality of the workmanship. Now, this actually has good workmanship, so it's, it's craft as well as art. This is great. So the authority vision on what it was like to attend this exhibition is told through the eyes of a retired engineer who's not sure it's art, but, it, you know, they've got technical skill, I'll give them that. And that's, this is lovely. This, is, this allows us to tell that sort of story in this sort of environment. And so I, I guess the question is, sh you know, should you do this? Should you surface the audience voice like this? And so does it work? And I mean, so it won some awards. It won some awards in Australia. Um, it's been downloaded and viewed more times than any other publication has been sold that the MCA has done in its whole history. So in that kind of context, I guess, yes, hopefully that means that it works and it's worth doing. And it's of the calibre of something that would come from this sort of space. And I want to talk a little bit about, a little bit more about this space and another project, which is another view into how we think about the audience experience. So this is a new building. On the right-hand side is the addition to the um, old Maritime Services building, which is, was a um, uh, maybe 50 years an office block, and then it got turned into a, a museum of contemporary art. And it really struggled as a museum space. It was very officey, and so. We raised some money and we built a new wing that's on the right there, and it kind of looks like this when you expand it. And we rolled out Wi-Fi across the whole museum because we were refurbing the whole museum. It was kind of easy to add Wi-Fi at that moment. It was like $100 a room to add it, so it was a sort of no-brainer. We wanted to support kind of mobile storytelling throughout the space. And I started looking at the kind of <coughs> analytics behind what was happening in these spaces and looking at how many people were connecting to the Wi-Fi and what room they were doing it because the app that we built had location awareness, room-based location awareness. So we could kind of tell, so this is in a week, but in a week, um, say, eight or, uh, 800 people connected to the Wi-Fi in the cafe. We know the kind of cafe area is really important. We know downstairs that the entryway is really important because we saw lots of groups of tourists coming in using the Wi-Fi and Skyping their family back in South America or in Asia and North America. That seemed to happen a lot. Uh, but we also see, which is really heartening, we see how much the, the sort of waiting spaces and the, and the exhibition spaces are being used and people are connecting. So these people are making connections and requesting content in those rooms during that period. So we know that people are in these spaces using our app. And so we know that because we're tracking use of this particular app, which is MCA Insight. We also know that they're using our Wi-Fi for other things, things that we may not be, you know, stories that aren't ours. So for example, this is the Wi-Fi usage during the hour before and the hour after New Year's Eve on 2012. So this is people using our Wi-Fi to upload photos of themselves or upload photos of the fireworks I showed you early on. So we know people are using our Wi-Fi, but they're not using it for our stories. They're using it for their stories. And so I had a look, okay, I picked the months at random. What was the downloads? What was the connection time? What were people using? And I was like, wow, people were, like, people are uploading a lot. People are downloading a lot. People are really taking advantage of the Wi-Fi. And so I had a look in the analytics that Flurry gives us for the app that we've built, which has all these kind of tie-ins to social media, and essentially no one's tweeting anything. No one's sharing it on, on Facebook from the app. They're using the app. It's really popular. They're going on tours. They're listening to content. They're watching content. Hmm. They're, they're, it's, it's a really, like, in museum analytics, it's a really popular app. However, we had some days where there wasn't a single share, some days where there was, some weeks where there wasn't even a single share. So apart from the fact that like the mechanics of sharing through an external app is, is a kind of poor experience in and unto itself, people weren't using it. But I knew, looking at the upload rates for Instagram, that people were using Instagram in the museum all the time. And what were they were doing? 
selfie. Museums are selfie heaven. And Anish Kapoor, <laughs> Anish Kapoor is like, tweet that now. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. Is Anish Kapoor, we call it the Anish Kapoor effect. And so we did page after page of people just tweeting and, and posting on Instagram of their experiences within Kapoor because of all the reflective services and because of our you know, contemporary fascination with um, selfies, actually no, like our long standing since the beginning photography fascination with taking selfies. So I had some interns and I had an idea and so we built something that we call MTA Now. And so MTA Now was a really simple feed. It was just things that had been tagged hash MTA Now, either by us or by the by visitors, either in Instagram or in Twitter. And so this is like, this is one of my favorite. This is the pram parking lot that happens during public programs for um, the thing called Woodstock called, called Art Baby. And there would just be this, this array of prams while the parents took their kids and their, and their favorite art projects. <coughs> what I noticed is that at the beginning, we were doing most of the tweets, so you can see that's the MTA Now account, but, but immediately we were just a, a bit player in the Instagram landscape. It was almost always um, visitors who were doing Instagram photos. So we thought, well, that's a great little project. People are really getting into it. Let's put it up in the gallery space. Let's put it up in the stairwells. And so I asked Rory. So that's Rory, one of the interns. I said, you've got, you've got, you work two days a week. You've got two weeks. You've got four days to build me an on-screen interface that has a randomized selection of Instagram photos that have been tagged MTA now. And so he posted one of himself standing in front of his work to show up to his friends. And we stood there and waited until it randomly came up, and then I took a photo of him for this. So that's Meta Rory. So it's Rory and then Rory. <laughs> and actually, you know what? It's Rory all the way it's down. It's Rory all the way down. And actually, Rory has just taken up a job in a startup, which is, that's awesome, on the back of this work, which is great. So I'm going to turn my camera around, um, and I'm going to take a selfie. Hashtag MTA now, and he'll understand, and it will come up on those screens in the MTA if I've tagged it MTA now, um, which is cool. So, does it work? Um, like I would argue yes, and one of the things that the MTA did, which I was part of, was we changed our contract agreement with visiting artists, and we made it so that we've always had it so the collection is photography enabled. Anything that isn't on a tripod or doesn't have flash, if it's a you know, a delicate work, a work on paper. And we have changed our contract so that any artist who comes and does a show at the MTA, and even Anish Kapoor, everyone we've dealt with since we made this change about three years ago, we, except for one example, for one bit of one show, we've managed to convince every single artist to allow us to photo photography. And it means that people are taking their stories and celebrating their stories alongside ours in their stream in a way that gets to the point that people are retweeting the tweets of or re-imaging re the images of being in the museum. And it's because we haven't differentiated between your content goes over here, this is the user-generated content bit, and this is the authority bit, mm -hmm. and you don't belong in here. In both of these projects, and things that makes them, for me, makes them strong, is that we've put the content, the storytelling that comes from the audience and from the curators and from behind the scenes, and we've put them all together and said, this is how you understand this experience, is by looking at it from all these different ways. So you can't tell, some of those photos are our staff, some of those photos are our staff official, you know, social media people, some of those photos are our staff on the floor. We gave all our gallery guides, we give an iPod touch. <coughs> Just if something awesome happens, if someone says something amazing, tweet it. If someone is doing something like we've got 50 people in one gallery, take a photo, tell a story mm -hmm. and post it. Or it's photos from the audience and what's become like for me a signifier that this has worked is people are going back to the old photos and tagging them MTA now mm -hmm. so that they appear because they're seeing it show up on other people's streams. They're like, wait, what is that? Oh, I can get, I can be on there. I was here like two months ago. So we're seeing, we're seeing like images show up from shows that were like three months ago on the screens because people are like, get in on that. That's great. I want to be kind of part of this storytelling. So they're the two ways that I think, you know, these are two ways of a kind of holistic approach that we've taken in, at the MTA and I hope to bring to uh, SF MoMA as we look towards our rebuilding project is currently closed, which is kind of exciting for someone who's a digital museum person, and we're reopening in 2015. So, thanks.
All right, a lot to digest there. Do we have one or two questions? One or two. All right, one and two, and then we're on our way. Publications, the app for iPad, yeah. and you use the code MW2012. No, what is it? M MW2013. Just as I was leaving the museum, I upped it to a thousand. So there's there's plenty to go around, but just you know, don't let the MTA know that because they'll be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so can MW2. You, can you say that into the camera? <laughs> MW2013. <laughs> so you have to download MTA publications first, and then you can download Anish Kapoor and the other. Okay, so more swag. We're totally winning on the yeah, swag front here. All right, I'm second question. With the swag <laughs> front here. Is any of the information uh, in the Instagram or the Twitter feed is curated by anybody who uses that? So the, the, the Twitter feed is just a search on that hashtag, so it's uncurated. The Instagram feed, because if you give people the chance to put public images in a public space, they take photos of their penis. There's like a time to penis, uh, which is like a... Uh, inverse order effect scale of how long it takes until you take a photo of someone's penis appears or an image of someone's penis appears. So the way that we've resolved that is that the same people who have been given the iPod touches in the gallery spaces to take photos and to record moments of serendipity that are beautiful and need sharing, they also curate. And so whatever they like in the MTA Australia Now account appears on those screens. So it's whatever, huh. we, sh whatever we shoot and whatever we like just goes into that mix. And so they just look at it sort of three or four times a day or whenever they're bored, whenever there's a gap and there's no one in the gallery space, they just pop out the phone, pop out the iPod, look for new stuff, and there seems to be always new stuff, and they pick the best couple, and then they, that's the curating process. And there's a piece that, I don't know, like if people are nerdy and interested, we put the code for it on GitHub because, you know, it's only like, I don't know, like 500 lines or something, mm -hmm. you know, to do the whole thing. Nice. All right, there was one more. We're feeling generous. Oh, I was just going to ask if you had to take the roof off. So we knew that we had to take it out, and so we built a flat wall. We built a trap, yeah. So we can now put in, yeah, stop to do that to this side in the future. <laughs> yeah. We also punched a hole in one of the walls. But anyway, so. All right, so thank you very much, Kier. All right, third, but not least by any means, we have Mark yes. Check and Ben Wilson from the Museum of yes. Science. It's your, it's your show, guys. Excellent. All right, they're going to be showing you some very cool stuff that they are working on. Uh, I'm going to move. Where am I moving, Ben? Maybe I don't know. I'm, I'm just going to sit wherever it makes sense. You can choose that. I stay where I am. Excellent. I shouldn't probably tell you this before we start, but we have no swag. So, um, I'm leaving. We have to wait two minutes. Later. But, yeah, okay. We'll, we'll whip out the Museum of Science Amex. Uh, we'll buy you all drinks at the bar. Um, Great, my name is Mark Check. I'm Director of Information and Interactive Technology at the Museum of Science in Boston. This is my colleague, Ben Wilson, who's our Interactive Media Manager. Um, ben and I started our museum careers many years ago, uh, back in Rochester, New York, at the Rochester Museum and Science Center, and uh, both went our separate ways. I came into the Museum of Science about three and a half years ago, um, charged with kind of reinventing and uh, employing strategy for both the information technology and the interactive technology sides of the house. And um, there were some definite challenges on the interactive technology side, which I'll talk about. And um, yeah, so that's it. Let's go to the next slide. I'm going to rock through the first couple slides here because we have some stuff that we want to share that I think is really cool and much more interesting than hearing me talk about the technology. Um, I really like the theme of this particular conference as we talk about rethinking museums because what we've been doing over the past three years is really trying to rethink what digital interactives are within the museum. As many of you in the audience are and, and my colleagues up here have talked about, um, it, it was really nice to hear the same themes coming up um, out of their presentations as well. The problem with a lot of digital interactives past is, you know, everybody I think if you ask them to picture a digital interactive in a museum, 
this is kind of what they see in their mind. Um, and we are guilty as much as many other museums of having these types of interactives still on our floor because once they're out there, they're really hard to kind of rein back in out of these exhibits that you build and we know how long exhibits last in our institutions, five, 10, 15, 20, 25 years. Um, so the technology can, and the experience can get a little bit antiquated. Um, the problem with a lot of these digital interactives past is they were very linear in nature. Uh, they weren't really exploratory. You just kind of go one piece of content to the next. Um, kiosk based, which is really, you know, you're going to this place where the computer or digital technology is. And we know that's changed a lot now. Uh, very solitary experiences. Um, I know, you know, you spoke quite a bit about, you know, the difference between collaborative and more social experiences. Very inflexible. A lot of us have spent a lot of money uh, creating technologies that we can't even touch the source code on or iterate out into future versions. Uh, so they're not sustainable as well. Um, often very expensive. I mean, I don't think most museums have a large, um, talented, interactive development team on board, which usually means that you're paying a lot of money to an outside interactive developer to create these for you. So there's a great deal of expense associated with it. Um, accessibility was talked about earlier. Most of these digital interactives are not made with accessibility in mind. Um, a lot of them are text and image based. We've essentially taken label copy and put it into a digital format on a computer screen for people to browse. And also mentioned earlier, it's very authoritative. Um, so we still tend to speak through this media with very authoritative voice. This is the message we're trying to send you. This is the type of content we want you to learn in this way from this particular exhibit. So that said, what do new digital interactives look like? And this is what we've been talking about as we've gone through the series of projects. Um, we, we want them to be much more open-ended. We want them to be sandbox experiences. We want to create a medium where people can go into without a linear or defined outcome. Um, even better if it can have multiple sets of outcomes from it. That's what we would really hope to get out of these interactives. Um, distributed technology. It's not you go to that place where the technology is anymore. It's that technology is in your pocket. The kiosk is in your pocket right now. In your mobile devices, it can be on walls, it can be on surfaces, it can be on tables. There's great stuff done with projection mapping. So thinking more about where do we deliver that digital technology. Um, encouraging collaboration, competition, and conversations. This is really about the social aspect, is how do we get more people to interact within or around the digital interactives that we're producing. Um, how do we make better digital interactives by doing a better job at iterating the development of these? Um, I think museums in the past have done a, a really poor job at iterating the designs of digital interactives. What we've generally done is uh, sat down in rooms with our colleagues and thought up a great idea and then paid somebody else to really implement that idea and then learned after the fact the things that we should have done differently. Um, we want them to be affordable, sustainable, um, so we like to leverage any open source tools, any communities that we can that are going to be available to future generations of developers. Um, we want to make it accessible, um, so that means universally designed, so we can reach a wide audience. But what we're also talking about here is utilizing the personal accessibility tools that people have on mobile devices. What we're finding more and more is people with accessibility needs, be they ADA related, um, accessibility needs, language accessibility needs, mobility, or even cognitive accessibility needs, there are a variety of fine-tuned tools on those mobile devices um, that, that they have those preferences already plugged into that allow them to consume content in the way that they want to consume content. Um, of course, incorporating audio, video, tactile, and location-aware type of feedback into these, so rather than just having information um, that is displayed upon a prompt using different methodologies for this information to get to the visitor. And, you know, again, we really want our visitors to explore, to arrive at conclusions and epiphanies on their own as they're using these interactives. So this seems lengthy. That's the most I'll talk. <laughs> um, but, but this is really kind of the list of goals. These are the objectives that we're trying to hit with each one of the projects that we're working on. Are we hitting all of these objectives on each one of our projects? Absolutely not. Um, and I think it would be really hard to create one digital interactive project that really hits this full list of, of requirements. But I think what we've done is use different opportunities to really implement different facets uh, of these goals and these objectives. And that's what we're going to talk about today is some of the projects we're working on. 
So this started in 2010 when I um, inherited a software development team. And to my surprise, found out that 95% of their time in their development was on business-related systems within the museum. Uh, so creating intranet services and replication between databases and things like that. But it was a creative, smart, wonderful team that we've grown. Um, now I'm proud to say here in 2013, 95% of their time um, is spent on, and, and they are now called interactive media. And they're doing some pretty amazing things. I credit Ben with a lot of that. Um, ben was at the Museum of Natural History in New York, uh, and I lured him up to Boston, as I like to say, on the uh, with a six-pack of Sam Adams and a live lobster. Um, <laughs> and he came up and really helped me uh, build this team. So uh, the projects we're working on, or have been working on, um, include a big opening of an exhibit hall that we just did called the Hall of Human Life. We're working on a project in conjunction with Pixar called The Science Behind Pixar, which talks about the process of making animated films. Um, we're doing location awareness technology uh, based on LED bulbs. We are, I can see the pictures here. Uh, we're working on another project called Create a Museum Media for Everyone, which was mentioned earlier in conjunction with a bunch of other institutions. So we're gonna take you for a quick spin through these projects. So the Hall of Human Life, 10,000 square foot exhibit. It just opened to the public last week. Um, and Ben, I'm going to let you talk about the technology and the experience. Okay, yeah, well, um, in the Hall of Human Life, uh, we were charged early on that the exhibit was actually going to be about the visitor. Um, we wanted visitors measuring themselves, comparing themselves to others to help really reinforce a lot of the uh, the volatility and interest that's in the, the life sciences nowadays. So we have a variety, officially like 15 of these link stations, but there's actually over 50 computers in the whole exhibit hall that uh, provide a five zero. Five zero. Yeah. There's 300 in the rest of the museum, so it's pretty intensive. Um, each one of these link stations uses a different biometric device or um, provides different activity for the visitor to actually conduct some sort of measurement of themselves. And we're also allowing them then to compare their data to other visitors who've come before them. We do that by giving them a wristband and letting them scan an old-fashioned barcode. We've talked about all kinds of different ways of approaching that uh, between using QR codes, using RFID, anything else you can imagine. We figured that cheap, simple, sustainable barcode, people know what it does, they scan it, and it works. And so far, optimistic on it. Opened last week, so obviously we're going to be studying that really heavily um, to come. But for each one of those measurements, we used a lot of different devices. Basically, each one came with its own application pro uh, programming interface. So on different platforms, different expectations, and we needed to glue this together into a sustainable exhibit. So we needed to talk to a lot of different oddball sensors from many different vendors. And this sort of reinforced something that we've been working on from the very beginning, which is we know that technology in exhibit halls have to change a lot faster. We can't just build it once and then wait 15 years and replace it. So our strategy is to move over to using an XML uh, schema. If, I, I never know how what percentage of tech folks I have in the audience. Who here is familiar with XML? Hoping a lot in this group. Cool. Um, so anyway, the, the basic idea is that we need to be language and platform agnostic as much as possible. So we are separating all the information about how we're populating screens with assets, what the input devices are, and we need to glue that all together with XML. So as we go through some of these other projects, that's really kind of the lifeblood of everything we're working on. We're capable of putting together um, an interactive component in many different languages and having it behave in a standard and consistent way. And then we can update and change that in a standard and consistent way because we've already encapsulated all that information in XML. Um, we're also doing this online. We've been using the D3 JavaScript library uh, and a Drupal module with it. So literally moments after you take your measurement in the gallery, you can pop onto the uh, HHL as we call the Hall of Human Life website, and uh, view your data right there. And you can look at it at home. You can enter multiple wristbands from family members and see how you all compare on the same graph using that. And um, of course, it all has standard WAMP and SQL database backend, which gives us all kinds of incredible data. Our uh, DBA is calling it Database Christmas, now that we have <laughs> visitors measuring themselves and all this. And we can actually look at all the analytics behind that, too, so we know between we're collecting information like gender and age, so we can actually start telling what, what components in that gallery are really interesting to different groups. And literally the moment after we went through our opening event, she ran home and whipped up some reports and built a business intelligence dashboard and started sharing it with everybody. So 
we're thrilled about all that. Um, and to the point of open uh, platforms, we built the whole exhibit using open frameworks, uh, an open source C++ library that's very powerful. Um, but you know, there's an overhead with any open source project, and that's one of the reasons why having the XML schema that glues it together allows us to not worry about something that may break or change in future versions. We could throw another platform at this very quickly. And yeah, Mark wants me to actually show you what it looks like. Dude, that's right here with him. Yeah. We want to see it all. How easily do you get distracted? In this activity, you will measure your ability to make quick responses while ignoring distracting images as best as you can. Some areas of our brains are involved in focusing our attention, while others are involved in responding to or ignoring attention-grabbing information. How might playing video games affect how well you ignore distractions? I'll talk so I'm just skipping through my, my age, so. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I absolutely will admit that I do play video games. For this activity, you will have two seconds to quickly estimate if there are more red or more blue dots. Press the red or blue triangular buttons to make your guesses. Images will try to distract you, so ignore them if you can. Ready to start? So I'm clicking probably incorrectly and randomly up here as we go through the experiment. So we're actually using computer vision to measure all of your responses right now. <laughs> and reprogramming you. So you get the basic idea. I'll skip through it. And um, since I skipped it, we won't get the actual answer out of it. But uh, before I skipped it, I got 10 right. And that's pretty good for doing it randomly. Um, so the next part is This overview shows how museum visitors scored. The vertical axis shows the score range. Lower scores show that people are better at ignoring distractions. Why did some people do better or worse? Your score is the red dot. The graph also shows the results of 200 other museum visitors. So we're obviously allowing people to explore Does playing graphs. video games help us ignore distractions in this activity? The horizontal axis now shows video games. Turn her down just a little bit. B explore gra graphs based on all the information that's being provided. We're surveying unique questions per station as well as, of course, once you've scanned your wristband, the very first time you do something, we ask you your, your sex and your age. And it's just a random barcode, so we're not really particularly concerned with uh, the perception of privacy issues, even though we have a comprehensive institutional review board that's sounded off on this. And uh, it's so far been really intriguing to us because we're also asking visitors to compare, for instance, trend lines that exist in research to what the visitors in the gallery are doing. And um, it's always a little bit messy. So one of our hopes is a little bit of data skepticism is part of the, the take home from this particular com uh, exhibit. And um, really at the end of the day, we just want to reinforce that the, the visitor is the exhibit in this particular component. And of course, um, we had to head to our obligatory gamification. So the moment you uh, complete a measurement, you get a merit badge, you run on it. Now we've found that kids are running around collecting all the different measurements in the hall. I was a little skeptical to see if that was being a motivator. I think gamification gets a little overdone now and again, but it's working like Gambuster so far. Excellent. While Ben's kind of switching over to the next demo here, I'll just kind of give you a, a quick overview of the science of Pixar. This is a great collaborative project we're doing through the uh, SMEC collaboration. Um, we're creating a 10,000 square foot exhibit on the science behind Pixar, bringing visitors through the pipeline of how a digital film's created. So we have interactives that just get them used to working in three-dimensional space um, to the point where they can create three-dimensional primitives and put those primitives together to make more complex um, um, types of, of, of objects within the environment. Then, of course, the skinning, texturing, animating, lighting, and at the end of this, the rendering process. Um, you know, 
two really cool things about this particular exhibit is one, this is the first one that we've really used uh, large multi-touch interfaces. And the second is this is the first exhibit that we've uh, tried to get users to interact in a three-dimensional environment, uh, which is something I think most museum visitors are not used to when they walk up to a screen, having that extra access um, associated with the interactives. Um, ben will talk a little bit about the technology, but the other thing I want to say that was great about this exhibit and that we hope to do with many others, we actually had a prototyping lab. Um, so rather than building something, putting it out there for a long formative evaluation, and then bringing it back in and making some tweaks, we iteratively developed each one of these prototypes and are continuing to do so by having them constantly on the floor, having visitors using them, and being able to get immediate feedback, making changes to the interactives, getting them back out there. Yeah, and uh, actually, I, I think one just area of clarification about the, uh, the 3D element of it, it's really 3D content creation, and that's, that's the area that we're excited about with it. It's plenty of 3D games, 3D immersive environments that have been tried to varying degrees of success, but this is actually involving yourself in the 3D animation pipeline. Um, we started out prototyping with another open source project, uh, Blender. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that. Um, raise your hands if you've used Blender or heard of it. So um, it is, for those of you who don't know, an open source 3D modeling and 3D animation software suite. Um, it's also really obtuse. It takes a lot to dig into that interface. In our first prototypes, we dragged it onto the floor and just gave some simple instructions and coached some visitors through the interface and had some almost encouraging success with it, but we knew we needed to do a little better because we only had a few seconds to teach them how to use uh, a complex 3D modeling environment. So we did some basic scripting and UI overhauls to Blender and started playing around with that. But with open source projects, the, you know, builds get forked, they go on different timelines, and it's, it's a powerful and interesting tool, but we needed to be a little bit more sustainable for that. So we started moving over to the emerging WebGL standard, which you know, hasn't quite been ratified yet, but is extremely promising, basically lets us do full 3D rendering real time in a browser using sta web standard technologies. And again, gluing it together with our XML schema, so we're consistent across all of our different galleries. And um, it took our developer who's working on this about a week to recreate the, uh, the 3D modeling experience we did in Blender in WebGL. So we found it very, use very, very easy to work with so far. And I can flip over and show a quick demo of that. So here we are, we actually sort of retained some of the Blender look to it just because we were interested in, in seeing, keeping it consistent with the prototype and we did with Blender to see if we ran any particular instances. This is gonna get a faith slip. The exhibit opens in 2015, so uh, we haven't given it any graphic design love yet. But the basic idea is we're providing instructions for visitors to be able to make a really simple 3D model like a snowman. So if you wanted to build a snowman, you could certainly create three different sphere, spheres and position them however you wanted. And I can testify that he's actually doing this live. Ed is watching my video. fingers move. This is Ben actually playing in real time. And, and it should be noted that Ben's doing this through a browser on a standard mobile device. There's no special software loaded in, which is when we talk about being responsive and being multi-platform, the movement to WebGL really makes it possible to take these fairly complex environments that we're creating on the museum floor and make them pervasive across a wide array of devices and platforms. Yeah, I'm doing this with, it's currently running in Chrome. So, and again, it's in full 3D, so I can move around. There's my amusing little fat snowman. But the great thing is, we're not enforcing that you build a snowman. We're not providing guides saying, put your sphere here, put this sphere there. We're allowing it to be an open experience, so if you want to build a castle, a battleship, or your own complex environment, you can go ahead and do that without anybody complaining about it. And even through prototyping, we've seen people take advantage of that, and that even gets, a, I think, a deeper level of engagement in the component. So we've been absolutely thrilled with the way this works. And the other th great advantage about using a web standard technology is it's completely portable. We, d we can change the computers in the back end very easily. If we want to switch platforms between Linux, between Mac, between PC down the road, it's going to be a traveling exhibit. We can do that, and it'll still run. If we want to move this over to mobile and make it available, which we're talking about doing, it'll immediately work there, and we don't have to do too much additional work for it. So we're, we're really thrilled with the prospects of uh, WebGL and HTML5, and we're going to be looking at doing a lot more of it um, in the days to come. Excellent. Uh, an informal observation that, that I would make about this as well in our prototyping lab is we've worried for so long in museum interactive development about, you know, can we make it so that a six-year-old can use it? 
Um, with multi-gestural technologies and three-dimensional spaces like this, the problem is on the other end of the spectrum now. It's people on the other end of the digital divide that walk up and kind of scratch their head and play around and walk away. I am a forever amazed at watching young children walk into this exhibit without any fear up to these, you know, multi-touch screens, three-dimensional environments, and just start rocking these interactives. I mean, just creating all sorts of interesting things. It's, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting thing to see. So, great. Um, so I'm just gonna briefly talk about this, and I'm sure Kate can talk about this a little as well. Uh, creating Museum Media for Everyone has been a collaborative uh, between uh, many organizations, but this has been really interesting for us in the museum in terms of, you know, we've spent a lot of time at the Museum of Science uh, in the past working on making physical exhibits accessible and universally designing uh, digital exhibits. But that was back in kind of that age of the kiosk type interactives that we spoke about before. Now that the nature of, of the digital exhibits are rapidly changing in terms of form factor, in terms of content, in terms of delivery, how do we start making those accessible for um, people who are blind or low vision or hearing impaired or mobility impaired? Um, and I'll let Ben talk about some of the uh, projects we've done with this. Yeah, so, you know, basically there were, there were three big components to it. Um, IDM worked on an audio layer that, that Kate's very familiar with, and I'm sure if he had questions, she could answer them exhaustively, um, about trying to make um, multi-user, multi-touch tables more accessible. We worked with the National Center for Accessible Media out of uh, WGBH. They worked on a really interesting piece that's going to have some, some, I think, important applications further down the road about... Um, customizing your museum experience and what are some of those things that you can you can tell a museum about you and your needs and your the affordances that work for you and everything in the museum could potentially react to it we're not quite there there's a lot of work to do but the white paper is going to be I think a very important piece to start us thinking in that direction and the part the museum of science worked on is you know here we were working on this giant hall of human life project with data visualization in it and we got part of the way towards making it more accessible by, you know, having audio text on the screen and having a video interpreter who's describing what's happening in the graph. But that's not really a native mo modality for everybody. So we really wanted to explore um, multimodal data explorations through data sonification, basically using a non-voice sound to indicate data points, as well as some haptic um, feedback. And it's been a, an absolutely fascinating process for us and the great thing about this project that was funded by the NSF is it started with a hackathon we had a whole bunch of people from many different institutions over to the museum for a week um, we did there was a, a couple of lecture presentations but then we all sat down and just hacked out a few early prototypes uh, and in a couple of days an amazing number of things came out of that um, we're currently using a data set about our um, Okay. We're using a data set about the wind lab on top of the uh, Museum of Science and different kinds of wind turbines produce different amounts of electricity based on the environmental conditions. And it's a very interesting data set for us and we have an exhibit down there that has a really old fashioned graph that um, is useful and interesting but again not very accessible. So the challenge for our project was how can we do that? We have been playing around with touch screens with tactile overlays, um, sonifying different data points as well as being able to scrub a uh, timeline across the entirety of the graph to have a sonification. And one of the fun things about it, if you look at the picture over on the left hand side of the image there, um, that is a dynamic air jet generation system which we were using to create graphs basically by with air pressure through various jets that would correspond with the uh, component. And, oh, we didn't get the other picture in there, but um, you don't have to explain what the yes. Yeah, so the visitor experience. The visitor yeah. experience on this, um, and you can sort of see on the uh, right-hand side image there. If you look on the front part of the console, you can see a series of little tiny nozzles in the front, and Ed's going to be my pointer. That is the undersides of if you move, Ed. If you move over to the next image, <laughs> the, <laughs> right hand side. That is the nozzle that the visitor is actually interacting with. And if you, as you wave your hand over that, we're using a leap motion to track position. And that moves the scrub line across a trend in the data. So you can feel the data trend theoretically in the air jets, hear a sonification of that exact trend line, and see it in the graph on the screen. We were really proud of this. Then we tested it. And. <laughs> 
the tests were fascinating in that, perhaps not unsurprisingly, everybody played it like a piano they were, or a harp. It was an air harp, basically, for data sonification. They were just moving their hand back and forth. They were fascinated with the leap motion, the gesture, and just the feel of the air, and they were paying absolutely zero attention to the content. So we're, we're honing, iterating, working through it, but just the spirit of the whole project was absolutely amazing for us, and we love this interface. We will find a place where it works. <laughs> Great. Um, I think I have like 30 seconds. So um, I will just quickly say that uh, another really interesting project we've been working on is in our Connors Computer Place exhibit where um, Ben and I had been looking for years at location-aware technologies. Suffice it to say, we had not found anything that was granular, affordable enough for us to use in a museum. Um, and we ended up uh, working with a local company called Bite Light who are doing location awareness. Uh, that's platform agnostic because it uses LED lights to signal the location points to the back and front facing cameras on the devices. Um, shameless plug, uh, tomorrow at 11.30 in this same room, I'll actually be talking more about this particular technology. So if you're interested, I think we can take it up then. And that's, I think, it. That's it? That's, that's it. it. All right. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo. Okay. Thank you very much, both of you. You win the award for cramming the most amount of projects into one presentation, I think. Kate? I just had a comment back on the, the digital divide piece. So one of my favorite anecdotes that I didn't get to was this 87-year-old volunteer who waited all day to get to use the multi-touch table at, at Hatfield. So when her shift is over and the visitors go home because they've been all lined up and, sh and she uses it, and she's flying around on it. And I said, so standard question, have you ever seen one? We've now. And do you have a tablet at home now? I don't have a cell phone, I don't have any of that stuff. And I said, so you seem pretty comfortable. And she looks at me with utter scorn and says, I see the commercials, of course I know how to use it. <laughs> so, so case in point, for me that was several types of things. One is it may or may not be intuitive, but the commercials are training her how to use this sort of piece. Yep. Um, and that even though she wasn't necessarily a, a, either a digital native or a technology based person, um, she felt very comfortable in terms of that. So I think where our divide was is some of the other pieces. The only other comment I was going to see since I ran out of time, I didn't get to show you, but if you want to see me afterwards, I'll show you this beautiful video out of Disney Research for the um, uh, haptic touch table that we've been talking about in the Creating Multimedia for Everyone group, where you'll be able to feel, it's a smooth surface, but because of the voltage, you can feel the shape of the picture of the artifact. You can feel the fossil in 3D, and I think that will really change accessibility on, on some of these pieces. Since you're showing the haptic mm -hmm. sonification, mm -hmm. I wanted to say we're, we're moving that way with the table. Yeah, especially when Disney makes that free and available. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What, I saw, what we see at Disney five years ago is something we will hack next That's year. That's right. It, it, will, it, will, it will be a free plug-in eventually. All right. Um, round of applause first for everybody. <laughs> bravo, bravo. Thank you for coming. Okay, we have a few minutes, so let's do some questions. So. The uh, interaction that had the flashing light and then the distracting picture, <laughs> could we or did we do any eye tracking to show the beast like you would the interaction for the picture and then the beast approach that in the air? Well, um, interestingly enough, we're using an eye tracker for a different component. Um, this, the, all of the ones in the Hall of Human Life are based on a particular research that was done and you know this was more about susceptibility to distraction we are using one that measures your um, instinctive reaction to different animals um, and basically regardless of whether or not you report you like snakes or chickens or things along those lines biologically you have a reaction to it that may be different than that and we're using a, an eye tracker for that one to measure pupil dilation so uh, we also do have a hub which has some live facilitated presentations every day, and the company that made the eye trackers currently, uh, SMI is the company. They, they've actually been out there and they've been doing some more in-depth eye tracking uh, demonstrations currently at, at the hub. Okay, in the back.
Yeah, um, visitor flow is something we're really, really looking at. You know, so part of it is handled by facilitation with, with on-site staff. And now that we have a lot of analytics, too, we're, we're able to heat map the gallery and look at what, where people are using it. So we do not consider this project done for, for 10 years. We, we built a platform and an exhibit that can change not only as research changes, which is an important thing, content's changing very quickly, but also so that we can change it based on visitor behaviors. And we're going through a lengthy remedial evaluation process right now, and we will enact changes. <laughs> so, yes, it's a work in progress. <laughs> Yeah, we, we basically are able to look at um, heat mapping of activity based on wristband scans, and we, we can get dwell time and a few other metrics based on that. There's things both based the analytics in the interactive itself and just the data and how we're flagging that in the database. Feeling jealous? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is our first one. We're, 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 we're just thrilled. We've been waiting to have an opportunity to do this for a long time. This is the first time we've had a whole gallery hooked up to a database. <laughs> yeah, e even if we're not doing another exhibit where we're feeding the data back to the visitors, I said the other day, we will never build an exhibit again where we are not capturing all this usage data behind the scenes. It tells us so much. Uh, Amen, brother. All right. Um, we're always interesting in presenting and sharing, and so we, yeah, we are looking at that. Um, we're already um, looking at, ver once we get through the remedial process and get, just get the exhibit where we like it, then I think we're definitely going to start exploring those options, but we have been discussing it. Oh, yeah, I was talking about Hall of Human Life, but Kate can talk. Um, in order so that other museums can look at the exemplar prototypes and what worked in terms of accessibility and what, what didn't. Um, one of our, our favorite partners um, is, um, is actually in this book talking about some of the accessibility issues with mobile phones and then some of the multi-touch pieces um, on that. So this is sort of the, the preview of that particular paper. There's one on accessibility here, but the accessibility piece will have a much larger scope. Right. But you should feel free to like hit Mark up whenever you see him and say that he should bring his whole team to Dallas next year and run a workshop just with the stuff that they have already built, because he'd love to. All right. <laughs> Yes, yes it is, and right now the assets are being generated algorithmic, I mean it's just math. We're, we don't have a lot in the way of visual assets. I mean there are, there will be some particular models that are used in different components that have already been pre-made, but this is just generating primitives and there's just basically the, the UI overhead that you'd have from any other page. So we're not, we're, we don't have really deep assets that we're worried about loading on the phones or anything along those lines. They're all being generated um, via the, uh, we're currently using 3.js as the library. So. No, it's pretty instantaneous. Um, here, I can replicate that. It might be cached, so. Show off. <laughs> All right. While he's doing that, any other questions? Don't forget, free stuff. Um, we have many copies of the HCI ISE report, which is so full of goodness, you will kick yourself if you don't actually bring one home with you. Um, and also, they're free. Um, Kate will also tell you about uh, why you should be submitting to Exhibitionist, which is AAM Names um, Magazine. Do you like the special issue editor or something? Oh, I am not. And I, it just lowly, loaded. I'm a lowly commentator in okay. this. Um, my, uh, my peers and betters um, have a, a great list. We have a list of the articles in it. I, I don't have enough that you can get an Exhibitionist from their website. This particular issue I was asked to mention is on new media transforming museums and exhibitions and visitors that just came out. So yeah. if you're not normally an exhibitionist person, this, isn't, this might be the moment to discuss that. All right. Any, any other questions? Anyone? All right. One more. How do you then share your stuff and create a new media? Um, Define you know, share. Oh, 
Oh, we are uh, more than willing. I mean, we some of it we do formally through we, grant projects. Th the Creating Museum Media for Everyone is going to have a do-it-yourself toolkit association, uh, associated with it, and um, we have a whole page hosted through open exhibits for Creating Museum Media for Everyone. So when the project's done, we will be sharing the XML schema and everything that went into the generation of those, and we're always interested in collaborating on other stuff that we're developing if we don't have a formal distribution for it. Yeah, and quite frankly, I mean, that's, uh, I think, a good closing note. It's one of the great things about this conference is if we can learn from anybody else and if we can share any information about how we're doing anything with anybody else, we are more than happy to do that. That's why we're here. So get our contact information, ask us how we did it, and we'll let you know, and then you can iterate it and make it better. All right, I think that's a great place to close. So thank you all for coming. Remember, the presentation should be up by tomorrow, so if you weren't taking notes fast enough, you should be able to see everybody's slides.